Hello there, insect hunters. I am here today in the beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia, where I'm at the Entomological Society of America meeting, combined with the Entomological Society of Canada and British Columbia, all combined into one huge meeting, where there's tons of entomologists, things are on sale, and while I've been here, I've gotten to meet some really interesting and cool people. One of those people was a person that has not discovered just one, but two different species of insects. So I'm going to talk with them about one of these new species and the cool name that it has, and then they're going to share with you guys some advice on how to discover a new species yourself. Let's find out. All right, I'm super excited to have Megan Wilson here with me, and she has discovered not one, but two different insect species, maybe some more in the near future. Likely so. <laughs> um, uh, tell us about the first species you discovered, just a little bit. The first species I discovered um, was from a region in South America called Guyana, um, in an area kind of two hours from civilization. So the species that we found was a cockroach, uh, had these kind of really feathery antennae. What did you name that species you found in Guyana? So the bulk of the work on that one was done by the graduate student at the time. So that one he, we named after the ranch um, in South America where we found it, which is called Karanambu Ranch. So we called this, this roach uh, Blaptica Karanambu. The feather-like appendages serve, in, uh, serve some sort of function? Or are they just sensory or what is the function of them? Uh, it's likely just for increased kind of surface area um, for feeling, um, if it's sensing out their environment. We didn't actually watch these ones like interact much in their environment. Hmm. We would set up a lot of traps around uh, the ranch for catching uh, cockroaches. We actually we would bait them with beer because they like the smell of fermentation. Nice. So roaches would just would fall into these traps and what we would do was we would look at them back at the lab and decide like okay is this a new species like when we tried to describe it you often get species descriptions that you didn't even intend to have. Were they uh, pitfall traps with beer in them? They were pitfall traps with awesome. beer in them. One and of we, my favorites. <laughs> we actually bought cockroach attractant which believe it or not is an actual product. There's somebody out there selling it, selling it. it's <laughs> apparently very expensive and they did not go for that. They liked specifically beer. You gotta have the real stuff, right? They need the real stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about the second species that you helped to discover. And this one you kind of um, were the lead on and you kind of mm -hmm. helped find this. Tell me how you found this and what it was. Okay, so um, we returned to South America a couple of years later. At this point I was a graduate student and we were collecting more cockroaches, except this time it was the social type termites. And while we were collecting, um, we noticed that there was this really, really strange mound um, built up a tree that looked different from other termite mounds, and that didn't look like that kind of like sand castle look. They weren't in logs, they were in this really weird kind of like gutter system mound um, with these strange structures built for shunting out rainwater. And we opened the mound up and saw that these termites were also really weird. Um, and when we were collecting them with what's called an aspirator, which is a little kind of like a vacuum seal tube, they were clogging up our equipment um, and by kind of, I don't want to say exploding because there was no noise involved, but <laughs> technically exploding. They were rupturing their guts and turning into this big gluey ball. Um, and so these were really fascinating to us when we saw this because I had never seen that before in termites. And what would happen if you tried to touch them? What, how would they react if you just tried to touch them? They would just the fall apart um, with the simplest touch. We were you calling them gluey termites because they would just kind of melt. Um, really? It almost yeah, just felt, looked like magic. You could just rub your hand along and they just... Yeah, they would just kind of like, it was like, it was kind of like touching like, I don't know, really, really soft like, like glue that's about to dry. Hmm. Like it'll just kind of like deform and sometimes their heads would separate <laughs> from their body. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so we knew these termites were strange and we brought them back to our lab in New Jersey and looked at them under a microscope. And when we were doing that, um, we noticed they were kind of even stranger. Um, other than the fact that more than half of them had their guts hanging out, there were some that actually had what appeared to be a new organ. and. It was very, very distinct. There were basically these six spots, six circular spots on their um, underside of their belly, 
and we have no clue what they do. This is something that if you know termites, you know this is something that has never been seen in them before. Um, so we're still trying to figure out what these things are and um, we think that they might make wax. Um, we've seen that they're secreting something, that they're you know, expelling some sort of chemical from their body, but what for? Uh, we don't know because we haven't watched them do it in real life, um, so we're going to have to go back and look at them. So with termites, as far as I understand, there's normally only three different castes. There's workers, queens, and then soldiers. Uh, these were only found in the workers from what you told me, but could this be some sort of sub-worker type cast? They might have some extra function, or what do you think? Yeah, so we definitely think that, and um, we're actually really excited by the fact that not every single worker had this organ. Um, probably 200 or so of the ones we collected didn't have it at all. Um, they just had a normal kind of like termite underside that you would see without these, without these weird pads. It was only seven individuals that had it, so whatever those individuals had it for has to be something really special. So you found this new species and you were kind of the lead on it and you got the chance to actually name it. What did you decide to name it and how did you come to that decision? So at first we didn't really, we didn't thought too much of a name and you know I didn't plan to really do anything too crazy or fun with it but I was talking to some of my friends back home who I play a lot of video games with and Dungeons and Dragons and um, I was telling them about this termite with them having no really previous termite knowledge before and they said, I know this termite. This isn't a termite, it's an alien, and it's called a baneling. It's a cast of you social alien from the video game StarCraft. And you know, I looked up some pictures and saw how this thing behaved, and it also explodes to defend itself. And it looks very similar to the termite that we just found. And I was like, you know what? I was like, I don't think I have any choice, but I gotta name it the baneling termite. So it's now named Amatermes after the genus, kind of the largest group it already fits into, because that's not new, that's already described. But we got to choose that second name, and we named it Baneling Eye um, after the StarCraft monster. Awesome. Yeah, well, that's awesome. So when, you, so when you discovered this species and you've worked with these things, I mean, you started doing this since you were 20, basically, right? Yep. What advice would you give to someone out there to discover a new species, what can they do? Because, you know, in my opinion, you think, oh, only these really old researchers that have been working for universities for years and years, they're the ones that are um, discovering things. How, how, how could somebody do this? What advice would you have for someone like that that wants to discover something and name them after a StarCraft character or whatever, <laughs> you know? Yeah, no. Play StarCraft, that is the first step. That's the first step. Uh, <laughs> play StarCraft. But the second step is, you know, um, you, there's multiple ways. You could choose something that, you know, is understudied. Um, so, you know, termites, cockroaches, insects in general are being discovered all the time. Microbes are being discovered all the time. Um, certain, you know, plants. You know, if you want to discover a new species, don't say, I'm going to describe the next species of, you know, monkey. Because people have been, you know, looking at primates, there's less diversity in that group compared to insects, which there's already a million described and counting. Always in counting. It's just we don't have even enough, enough time to, uh, to describe them all. That's how many there are. So A, choose a group that needs to, be dis needs to have new species uh, described. But the second thing is you can go to a very remote region of the world where nobody has, you know, even looked to see what's there. And that was the case for both of the species that I just mentioned. Um, it's not, you know, this like hiding in plain sight. It's something that literally just nobody has done it. Um, so those are two good ways to do it. You, the third way actually is to go to, you can actually do this by going to museums and there are species that, you know, some expert in that field knew was different, knew was new, literally said species novus, so it's a new species and it's in a collection already ready to go and you can just describe it um, if they, you know, no longer, like if they're not working on that project and if, you know, that person has passed away, you could go and you can continue their legacy and you can, you know, go and describe those species and that's helpful for future generations. Yeah, so but I'd also, I, I would also say, and you can tell me if you think this is important, but you also need to learn insect taxonomy. You need to learn the different yes. parts of the insects yes. and really become an expert on whatever type of insect you want to find a discovery of because you've got to 
start learning those reproductive organs and how many uh, hairs are on a certain leg. And, you know, in my yeah. opinion, that's not the most exciting thing to me. But, hey, maybe no. something after mailing, <laughs> that's exciting. So maybe yeah, that's it, the is, <laughs> it, it is worth it to learn all those little parts. No, absolutely. Yeah, you definitely need to know all those things. And even with that termite that I'm talking about, I mean, it would have been simple to say if every single one we found had that new organ on it. Like, that's the sort of thing you point at and you say, that's a new species, it has a new organ. Like, that's easy. But it was only seven out of, you know, several hundred that had it. So I had to sit there and say, okay, is it possible that we've never seen this new organ because somebody else collected this, named it, and just it's so rare that they didn't see the organ? that maybe they just collected, you know, a hundred of them and they didn't manage to get one that had it. Or it's some seasonal thing that only appears in the springtime. Or, yeah. you know, they molt and they lose it. Because um, that does happen in other insects with certain organs. So you have to, you know, really know, like, what you need to know. But <laughs> it's definitely possible and achievable. And if you get that background, you can do it. Yeah, so... What do you guys have for plans? Do you guys plan on going back to get more samples so you can get a better sample rate and see? And are you going to study the behavior now? Or what's, what's the next yeah. step for this species? So the behavior would be the big thing. Well, thank you so much, Megan, for coming on today and telling us thank about you. the baneling termite. How can folks get in touch with you on social media? So they can reach out to me at my Twitter handle, which is uh, at usocialmeg, uh, with an E-U at the front, social. Awesome. Well, that yep. sounds great. What do you guys think? Do you guys have a better alternate name for this species that she found? Um, let me know in the comments what you think. And if you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, and click on the bell to make sure you are going to be notified of every new video coming out. And stay tuned next time for The Insect Hunter, where big adventures start small.